Uh, welcome to the uh, May meeting of the Education Committee. Uh, as usual, can I just remind members that the uh, meeting will be recorded and subsequently made available to the public for listening purposes. So Claire, if you want to take us through uh, Severant and apologies. Good morning, Chairman. Apologies from Councillor Karen Carruthers and we're missing Councillor Mayo and Councillor Nicholl. Any apologies? Thank you. And the committee clerk has informed me that Andy Ferguson has replaced Ian Dick. So do you have any declarations of interest? Jim? Jim? Thanks, there's not so much a, a declaration of interest as a, a, a question of interest. Why is the John Wallace Trust Scheme an exempt item? I don't think it ever was before. It contains the names of the recipients, Councillor Dempster, so for data protection purposes, we have to require it to be exempt. I thought that would be the answer, Goats, but we do that with area committee all the time. We name people the amount they're looking for and where they live. So I don't understand. Anyway, not for today, but something we need to look into because it, 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 if no necessary, it shouldn't happen. Uh, the report does contain addresses as well, which I know would be readily available in the outside world, but for the purposes of putting committee papers out, it's um, considered an exempt item. It just would appear there's no consistency within the council, and that's not something we would accept. We don't. I'll take my on board. Okay, item uh, three: the minutes of the uh, education committee meeting of the 31st of March 2015. Is everyone satisfied? That's a true representation, a true recording of the event. Yep, that was Redmond. Right, we move on to. Item four, implementation of free school meals to primary one to three pupils. Now, as you'll be aware, the Scottish Government uh, brought in a free school meal initiative, which started on the 5th of January 2015, which provides free school meals to all primary one to three pupils. And we've got Alan and uh, Gillian to uh, speak to this. Just anything you want to add to the report? Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, no, not anything more I'd to add. Uh, just, I think, uh, bringing a short report as requested to the committee. Thanks, Alan. I, I think it, uh, it is praiseworthy that uh, the uptake is 82% across the region, which is well above the, uh, the Scottish Government's target, 75%. I think we should be congratulated on maintaining the, uh, the, uh, the high level of uh, uptake. So I'll throw the uh, report open to members. Andy? Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, interestingly, I'm looking at the percentage of the take-up in some of the schools where you would have thought it should have been higher. Is there any information we can get as to why it's particularly low in some of the some of the some schools that you would have, have expected the uptake to be much much higher? Any some advice on that? Thanks, Chair. I think it's 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 there's no fixed answer to why the uptakes are are lower in some than there than others. I think uh, as the paper details what we're looking, we've retained one of the implementation assistants that can assist us with that. And we're working towards trying to meet this. All the schools meet the minimum target, 75% is the benchmark we've got. I think it's, it's, it's as similar as it is in general school meals. Some are high and some are low. And I think it's down to ourselves as the operation uh, services to, to, tackle, to, to work with the schools to try and tackle them and get the take up. So short answer, no fixed remedy to them that's low. Ian? Thanks, Chairman. Uh, just in regards, uh, just probably on the backhanded question, of that, so I looked through it, it was, I mean, it was interesting, uh, we're way above what the Scottish Government's expectations was. So what are the drivers here in regards to, because I'm just thinking break Act's 99%, almost 100% uptake, and there's other similar, the then again, doing below the, the mid-70s, really, we're, we're quite high, we're doing very well, I think. So what's the drivers towards increasing that? Okay, what, what are the real reasons? What do we see, I would imagine? You've got thoughts in my mind, certainly, the potential places of uh, large scale deprivation and such. Like, where, where people are deprived, school meals are absolutely essential. So, out with that, I mean, what are the main drivers for actually uh, primary, uh, having free school meals? Alan? 
I think the drivers are that we, we market them. The financial aspect, certainly from where we are in, in, in the world today, is that we've been driving that forward. I think the marketing strategy that, that has got us, I think, and, and the impact of having the high uptake, which up to yesterday was the second highest in Scotland, I think has, has shown that the marketing strategy of trying to say, one, the goodness under the Nutrition Bill legislation, so the health benefits associated with school meals, the social aspect associated with school meals, and I think the financial aspect is a key driver for, for that moving forward this year. I think that's the areas that we targeted as far as the marketing strategy was concerned, and we, we launched that along with the new Provenance brand, which is a, a initiative that we're doing to try and support small and, and medium enterprises and local produce. I think that was marketed and the strategy associated launched exactly the same time as the P1 to P3 initiative, and I think that's been a key driver behind it as well. So we're sticking to we're going to stick to them marketing strategies as we move forward and work with the schools. I think the key behind it is, is getting the whole school approach and. And I think the better eating, better learning strategy that we're working with education at the moment will tie into that and improve the increase in uptake as we move forward. Well, thanks very much for that answer. I think it was a, a good answer. See, in regards to the, we're, we've underspent on the 600k what was allocated for Scottish government. What, what's the potential revenue consequence to the council thereafter when this runs out? And is it, this implement, it's looking successful at the moment, certainly. What is the potential revenue consequence? Yeah, the 600k was capital money that was allocated to, to try and get us to, to put equipment in, and that, that, that was the 600k that we agreed to finance that we could carry forward, so best utilise that capital spend. The revenue, the funding is allocated every year as part of the Scottish Government uh, award, um, and that we're monitoring the uptake associated with, we had projected 80% uptake, and we're working closely with finance continuously, and we're doing a, we're doing a, a new model on that, on the 85-86% to ensure that the revenue budget will be adequate but as, as it stands at the moment more than comfortable the allocation that we've got will be retained and, and will be enough to, to move it forward. Jim. Thanks Stuart. It's an observation and I'm probably not get an answer today but uh, Kelleholm sits in the SIMB Scottish Industry Council multiple deprivation area and it's the second lowest uptake of all schools and I just wonder if there will be some work done in that school to try and ensure that every pupil gets the opportunity of a, a free school meal and actually takes the opportunity because of the peer issues there within that whole area. Oh. Yeah, Chair, thanks. I think absolutely yes. I think the answer to that is yes, yes, that we've been looking forward. I think we launched in January. We're identifying them that's low and obviously the ones that need additional resource working with our partners in education, we're, we're highlighting them and putting more effort into them schools, especially the ones in the deprived areas. That's great, thanks for that, Chair. I think this is a, 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 an issue in which we'll have regular updates anyway, so we can keep on monitoring and ensure that we do put the appropriate measures in place, particularly in the areas of keeping quality of education, unlike when I was at school. Thank you, Chair. It's very encouraging to see our education authorities have been high uptaking free school meals in the whole of Scotland. Um, I would like to see our authorities to do better, um, you know, in terms of the 100% uh, uptake if that's possible, and we will endeavour to do better, I'm sure. Um, what I would like to know, do you have any ideas of how many people are entitled to free school meals within the school. So how do you tackle these and, uh, people who have to come forward? Everyone's entitled to free school meals in the P1 to P3. Alison? Yeah, thanks, Chair. It goes without saying that the main purpose of the exercise is to get children to meals um, but I, 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 it would be interesting to see the effect of the collective school and that education has and it's been something that we've been seeking out for the last two or three years. At this stage I think probably Stuart is it's something we can uh, monitor in the years to Ronnie? Uh, just going to follow on from uh, Jim on the areas of deprivation, including that, it's a, it's a low uptake as well, 63%. Uh, but do we have comparative figures? I know the council did the, uh, the preschool meals in P1 before 
uh, the, you know, the sector uh, from the, the Scottish Government. So we have, you know, prob um, uptakes from then and the P1s as comparison to now and, uh, you know, what's relative to the area of deprivation, they, they, they all seem relatively low. So is that like 100% of the ones that took it before or uh, is this because of the dilution in the, the two and three? That would be really useful to look at. I don't have anything definitive, but we have asked, we've done a number of chops of the data to try and see if it's correlated with the size of the school or, play, or supervision of the school. We haven't gone into detail and I don't have any benchmarks, but that's certainly something that we would be able to look at. Gail? Okay. Yeah, I think that's all I've got. Thank you, Chair. Just a uh, few brief points, just picking up on Councillor Wick. We rolled this out earlier than a lot of other authorities anyway in P1 and P2, I think, two years ago. Um, and we were certainly looking to try and gather data of, of how that progresses up through the school. So we should be beginning to see a wee bit of a pattern. Um, and I think that would be useful in any future reports because the key driver to it is hitting them in the formative years, but encouraging the habit to continue through into four, five, six, seven, and eight, and nine secondary. Um, so I think, as I say, a wee bit of data on numbers further up the school next time round would be really useful. And rather than just having percentages, if we could have the number of schools, because 100% of one is an awful lot, and it would be nice <coughs> to see how many children are actually benefiting from it, rather than just a, a blanket. Yeah, th thank you, Chair. I think just a bit of clarity. We, we did run the one P1 to P3, and then we, we reverted to just P1s. So we're, we've been running up the last, I think it was almost uh, two years prior to the initiative coming in. I think on the basis of evidence and how that's worked is that our, our primary school meals as a whole sitting at a 12-year high. So I think we've got that, I think, up, but absolutely, I think we maybe can evidence that more in a, a little bit more detail for members associated with uh, uh, the actual detailed impact across the board of that. So. Right, we've got no more speakers, so if we can move to uh, the recommendations. Members are asked to note... 2-1, the uh, spend of approximately £200,000 related to the preparation for P1, P3 free school meal implementation. 2-2, two, two, the additional time allocation for dining room supervision as detailed in paragraph 3.8. 2-3, the approximate capital spend for 2015 as detailed in paragraph 3.9. And 2-4, the above average uptake in Dumfriesen and Galloway with regard to primary 1-3 to three, free school meal uptake as detailed in paragraph 3.12. Um, particularly noting that we are the second highest in Scotland and have a very good 12 year high. Very encouraging. Okay. Turn to uh, item five. Which is post results service, uh, Scottish Qualifications Authority. Uh, Nithsdale Area Committee on the 4th of March, where we agreed to uh, receive a report on Scottish Qualification Authority appeals procedure and the impact on Dumfries and Galloway schools, uh, given that um, schools now have to pay to make an appeal and what uh, impact this was having. So we have uh, Alison go to speak to it. Do you have anything to add to the, the report? Not at this time. Okay, so I'll pass it over to discussion. Ian? Thanks, Chairman. When I read this report, I wasn't at the Nithdale Area Committee, but I just took the assumptions through. It was it was uh, contained within the, at least my understanding from from reading the report was that there was an assumption from the Area Committee that it might have been the, the additional cost to the appeal might have been having an effect on the amount of appeals. So I wonder if we just had a, had a reflection on that from the report author author because it, then it came across that that wasn't wasn't the real case. But I did find it difficult to understand some of the the, the way it was described. It's quite complicated at times. So I wonder if we just had a a little bit more of an outline in regards to that. Alison? <coughs> uh, no, you're, you're quite right to conclude that uh, the charges had no impact on the number of appeals. Um, using the words appeal is actually where the problem arises because the old appeal system whereby if a child didn't get what was expected they then submitted evidence after participation, uh, that's not what happens anymore. What happens now is that you can ask for effectiveness of child's script to be checked 
and to the uh, a market view. And all they do there is no new evidence to bring forensic at that time. All they do is they actually go through the actual sites that China sat and they check the guidelines for market that have been applied appropriately. Um, prior to the children actually sitting in the unit, pr sorry, prior to that, there are all sorts of checks that take place. And because of that, the number of requests for marking the view is, is lower. Uh, in the old appeal system, the opportunity was there to provide additional evidence. That no longer exists. So really two completely different things. And that's why you'll find there's a line in the report that says that it's really misleading to actually look at the numbers of marking views and look at the numbers of appeals that you have, uh, because they really are two completely different things. They're really two completely different systems. Okay. I think that's certainly given me a bit of clarity, but I think the message needs to be given to the pupils um, who, at, you know, anecdotally now believe that there's no point in doing prelims because I've got nothing to fall back on anyway. And, you know, I'm, what does it matter what I get in my prelims? And, and I think there's a sort of morale issue perhaps in a few schools with senior pupils because they, they feel that there's a barrier now, you know, um, and, and often it's a cost barrier. So they say, well, it's just too expensive for the school. So um, they're not going to go back and do that for me. So it doesn't really matter what I do there. And I think the schools have got to do a bit of work in explaining that to the senior pupils who are actually very understanding and very intelligent, but they're not getting that message. They're, they've simply been told there's no appeal process anymore. Um, you can't fall back on your prelim mark if something goes wrong unless you've broken a leg and you're in hospital or something like that. Um, so the prelim system to them now is kind of defunct. And I think that we've got to get the head teachers and the senior management team to get a much more positive message out to the senior pupils and those coming up into the system. But as I say, that's anecdotally from a few schools that the pupils just think, well, the point in doing prelims now because if something happens, it doesn't matter. I've got nothing to fall back on. Okay, that's on board. But what I would say is that um, there was uh, some significant work done by the schools ahead of this to explain the system to the youngsters. I have to say, sometimes what, what people say and what uh, youngsters sometimes hear may not necessarily always uh, sort of match up, but I can assure you that significant work was done. If uh, I need to go back to the head teachers and just ask force that message to result of that certainly is not the case. And, and, it, and it really, and it absolutely is not. I would have to say in fairness though, I think that's possibly um, an idea that has come to them from other sources, possibly through the media, because it's, it's never ever been, and you, you can see from, from the report that I've given here that possibly this is not an issue, and that the education department uh, took steps right from the outset to make sure that cost would not influence the decision to request a marking review and the name is, the answer is really in the name. It's not an appeal against what happened on the day of the exam. It's a marking review. It's a review of the actual written decision that was being taken. Just on the back of it, that's what needs to be told to them because they still think that, that the kids are still calling it an appeal, you know, and, and they now feel that they no longer have the right of an appeal um, and, and some of them think it's because of the budget. Thanks, Chair. Um, it might be worth just um, giving a little bit of background to members as to why the system changed, as opposed to just the outcome of the new system. Um, the old system, in some ways, gave, arguably from the SQA's point of view, gave far too much credence to internal investigation, internal assessment and prelims. And we'd got to the stage, SQA would say, where almost every child who failed an exam or didn't do as well as expected was appealed for. And that caused an enormous industry uh, and to some extent took away from the importance of actually being able to go and sit an exam. So philosophically, that's been turned on its head a little bit. And arguably, yes, sitting a prelim and doing well doesn't guarantee anything in terms of it. But in terms of process, sitting a prelim and doing well is a staging post for youngsters going through. So I think it is up to schools to explain what potentially are the benefits of the new system. Yeah, I mean, I suppose there's a, there is a, a different point of view that teachers should know their pupils best, or you know, if they should know their, their, their you know, their capabilities uh, within that. But we're not here to argue the system; it's here, and that, that's it. Uh, and we deal with that. Uh, 
you know, there is a confidence issue there as well regarding the, the, the processes and the procedures that have already, you know, the SQA have agreed that they, they're in flawed procedures before. So there is a confidence issue there as well. And if this new one isn't proven, if you want, and we don't know how to prove, prove that at the moment unless until it happens. Uh, is there anything that we are, you know, putting in mitigation to any, uh, you know, any problems arising or is, are we dissecting it, if you want, in each area to see that it is going to work? The, the SQA's quality assurance procedures themselves identified where there were some um, things in the, 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 the processes that they could improve upon and improve upon. And it's, uh, they've already identified those and they've given us some indications of what those are going to be. Now, I see that as being a, a, a head teachers have uh, received that and it's been welcomed, you know, that has been welcomed. We have two further meetings to come, one on January the 9th, which is a national SQA conference at which there'll be further discussion of this matter. And then again on the 10th of June, we will have a regional coordinators meeting. Now, that meeting is one of the best attended meetings in, in the in the Heath and Gallows for Education Services because the SQA work with us. The, it's a very rich relationship we have with them. And because we don't, if we, if we find there's something we want to discuss with them or we would like for them to work on or to improve, particularly in relation to the rural agenda, uh, we have found them to be very open to that, ready to come back to us. Um, uh, there are always at least two members of the SQA uh, attend that regional meeting. The last time there were three. Uh, we give them questions at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, sorry, we give them questions two weeks ahead of the meeting. They come with answers to that meeting. So there's a very rich relationship between the Heath and Gallery and the SQA that will help to uh, help them address uh, some of the, the, the things that, that have happened with them this first year. And the other thing I would like to say is this, that the SQA is made up of teachers all over um, Scotland and a large number of them, Heath and Galloway staff, are actively involved in SQA work. Uh, we have nominees, we have team leaders, we have markers, we have question setters, and all of our nom all of the people that are involved in Heath and Galloway are helping to feed back to the SQA how their procedures can be further refined. But I um, have uh, heard what the most of what the SQA are planning to do. Head teachers are hearing it, and we're overcoming um, some of the. the some of teachers' confidence in us to do that, confident that we can do that because of the nature of the relationship we have with them. Jim McComb. Thanks, Chair. Given the less than, than robust assurances given from SQA last year, do you anticipate an increase in the number of requests for 2015? To be honest, when I wrote this paper, I, I did, because I thought that that would be a not unnatural reaction to what we want to hear from what's happened. But as time is going on, and also given what I've just referred to, that we've got two further opportunities to engage face to face with the SQA, I believe that <coughs> confidence on the part of the head teachers will rise. So although in the end of this paper, I'm suggesting that the number of um, rem rem remark requests may rise, that may not happen because, as I say, we're just working to, we have further opportunities to, to uh, build head teachers' confidence given the steps we are taking. No more indication. Your indulgence, sorry. Um, it's just the, 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 the table on page 19. Um, I mean, 25% of the higher requests were actually changed, which seems to me quite a high amount. But again, we don't have figures in, of how many um, exams were sat across the entire region at these levels. So, you know, looking at the 124 um, that didn't change, 168 that were requested, it's 168 of how many? And I, and I think for context, from our point of view, it would have been useful to know how many hires were sat in that year so that we could see you know, how many have been challenged in comparison to the amount sat and the same for the other levels. Say 25% seems quite high, but it might be 25% not an awful lot of it. I'll just take the point and I'll make sure that the next time I submit figures that I'll 
We turn to the recommendation. We ask to note how the recent introduction of the charge to the Scottish Qualifications Authority appeal system has influenced the number of appeals put forward by secondary schools and the authority. We've had a good discussion. I think we'll have uh, further information in the, the uh, required format in due course. If we move to item six, school transport contingency fund, and this is in recognition that um, um, for families on uh, very restricted incomes, actually getting the uh, the children to school can pose a, a real problem. And we have heard anecdotal uh, um, tales of pupils possibly withdrawing from school at an earlier stage than they uh, would normally have done because of the uh, the strain it puts on the uh, the family budget. Uh, so this is a uh, a new contingency fund which we're looking to uh, set up to help uh, pupils coming from families in a very restricted uh, um, financial situation. So I've got um, Sheila Rusby to, uh, to speak to this. Uh, is anything you want to add, Sheila? Not, not at this point. Okay, so I'll throw it open to members. Ronnie? Leave the recommendation. Andy? Um, thanks. Uh, uh, through you, Chair. Sheila, what session of the Education Act is this uh, money going to be awarded under? I would have to take advice from the Delegation Commission on that one. Certainly, the Director delegates to the grants and bursaries to me as Head of Service, and I would just take responsibility for getting back to you on that. Is that and the, the reason I'm asking, Chair, is if it's Section 49 or 51, one would affect the benefits to the people applying, one wouldn't. Uh, that's a spice briefing for the Scottish Government. Chair, Chair can I, yeah, I, th I think that's a really good point. And one of the things in terms of um, developing fully the arrangements and coming back and reporting to you is we need to be very careful about who the money's paid out. Looking into that at the moment, I, my, my, I don't want to go on record as being definitive on this, but I suspect that we wouldn't be able to pay the money direct to families, but in fact pay the money direct to the transporters in order to avoid that problem. So it's a, it's a good point that you make and something that we're looking at. Thanks for that assurance. Um, just, uh, I know in 3.5, the, uh, the consideration of poverty proofing the school day, we're looking at other aspects as well, which may uh, put strain on family budgets. Perhaps in due course we could have another report to the committee to uh, monitor progress on that at some point. Hmm? Yes, we'll, we'll bring something forward in relation to that. Could we go to that back? Yes, in relation to aspects of access to school and that sort of thing. Other reasons for that? So if we can move to the, uh, the re recommendation. Members are asked to 2.1 agree to the Proposed proceeds for allocation of school transport contingency fund. I note from the director's note they suggesting that of August 2015. Are happy with that? And 2.2 agree to receive the £250 per pupil, recognising the level of resource available and in all likelihood to be paid directly to the transport. Let me take into account the, uh, the point that uh, Andy made earlier on. 2.3, agree to receive a further report in the autumn given detail of progress and levels of allocation made. And 2.4, note the link to wider activities linked to raising poverty awareness at the schools and other reports in the due course. Right, turning to item seven, the director's six monthly assessment of business plan performance education services. Uh, obviously, as in the title, this is the uh, six monthly uh, progress report. Um, and Gillian Bryson is here to speak to this. Is there anything you want to add to the report, Gillian? Thank you, Chair. Uh, my colleague Gwyneth Fairbairn will support us with a statistical question. Can I just add for members by way of an explanation of timing? 
bringing this report to you today, it was envisaged that this report would be brought alongside our refreshed business plan, as was stated in paragraph 2.6. However, there was governance advice following consultation, which was to delay the business plan until, June, uh, until July, and this would allow the member's seminar with Education Scotland to take place during our inspection phase three, which is on the 2nd of June. So given the timescales, we decided to present our six monthly report at this point, our full report will be presented as normal in September following the exam results. So it's, it's slightly out of kilter than we normally report in, in March, but that's the reason for it being here. So we're talking to uh, Dave, members? Jim Dempsey. Thanks, Jerry. Just on, on, on page 32, and again, it's about P7 pupils and 20% most prescribed data zones, average standardised age score and alert. And if you look at look after children section, not only are we doing that page, but there, there are issues to address with that particular group of, of, of pupils. And if you go to page 36, the very bottom section, continuously develop the skills and capacity of all staff to better identify learning needs and more effectively intervene to improve outcomes for children, you see there's an alert there too. So are they connected, or is it simply it needs to do some more work in specific areas, both with pupils and, in, in some cases, areas or, or particular schools? I think our teachers would expect to meet the needs of all pupils, and as with the, particularly with the Looked After Children group, this is a small number of but they're not good enough, these results aren't good enough, and we will continue to work and have high aspirations for all of these pupils. We, we now have Scottish averages, and Gwyneth can talk to those slightly later. So we know that some of our primary seven figures are perhaps not a start against Scottish averages, they are against the UK average, but these looked after children figures are lower yet. So we do have a looked after children working group, we are looking at individual targets for individual pupils. The head teachers will say that looked after children are meeting their targets. But as a whole, the picture on, as an average doesn't look good. But as Gwyneth reminded me on the way over today, there are 300 pupils across our schools who are looked after. So in primary five, that's a relatively low number of pupils. And it may be one or two pupils will view that either positively or negatively. But it's not good enough. We will continue to do more. And on the part that, 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 that there's an alert about the development of staff, on page 36. Code DG 11 EF 505B is two of it. Second to the bottom. Target I. Target I. Oh, my apologies. Yeah, I, I, yes. I think I'll, I'll hand over to Gillian, but I don't think the two things are connected, to be honest with you. Because that's what my concern I, was, that no, one no, actually no, fed no. off the other, if you like. If, if the chair wouldn't mind, I could maybe just add one other thing about looked after children. Um, we, we know that school has a huge impact on looked after children. We know there are wider issues as well. And quite often some kids have got sort of chaotic lives, very challenging, and we need to have really high expectations for them. As a whole council, um, you'll see from a, a, the, report, the Children's Services Update report that will be published next Tuesday and brought to full council, there's a real focus on corporate parenting. Uh, that report suggests, as a council and with health, that we're beginning to make the right sort of inroads and make, get better connections. We should have been doing better on that agenda. I'm quite convinced if we can get the wider agenda uh, appropriately delivered, we'll begin to see significant improvements around attainment. But again, I would go back to Gillian's point uh, and Gwyneth's point that in terms of attainment for any particular year group for looked after kids, the numbers are so small that there can be an enormous fluctuation on, on those kids. But at the same time, if the numbers are relatively small and we've got the systems that are there to monitor them, we should be able to make a difference. Thanks, Jim. Alistair? Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm looking at uh, page 35. Um, page KPIs, um, ES01G, provides support to enable all young people leaving school to have the opportunity to progress into a positive and sustained destination. The targets have been met, or almost met, and that's fine as far as it goes. However, my question is, 
um, it would not be useful uh, if we had KPIs that told us the numbers that stay in a positive Certainly this has been raised on a number of occasions with our employability colleagues. The sustained destination is something that is obviously very important and we pick up anecdotal evidence that people have short term contracts or when the phone call is made they happen to be working because it's a Christmas delivery or but it's not necessarily a full time positive destination. So that's certainly something we've raised with our local government benchmarking colleagues. We 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 use the data that we get from skills development Scotland, but certainly we should be looking at how robust that is. May I suggest that that's something we can pick up at our member seminar and looking at our KPIs for next year. Um, I was going to bring it up later anyway, but we had this discussion at area committee recently, and, and that was exactly the point that was raised. And um, by peer, for instance, I ended up um, talking to folks in skills development Scotland anyway. And they've assured me that they've changed their processes now and they make a second phone call in March and follow up thereafter as well because we, we were concerned. So actually, Skills Development Scotland have changed their processes to make sure that they then know, you know, three months, six months, and nine months where, where that people is. So that was good. Congratulations on the seminar as well. That, that's excellent. That's really helpful, actually, because if that data is there, you can therefore. Dick? Yeah, just uh, draw your attention to page 41, the exception, half year exception report on the percentage of staff who have completed an annual performance development review. There seems to be a worrying downward trend here from over 80% to just less than 65%. It says we, comment says we expect an increase in the summer term as schools undertake self evaluation and improvement planning processes. Are we comparing like for like from last year? Are we did we take the did we take the figures? Is this relevant? Is it relevant if we're taking this at the same time of year as last year? But, and and uh, can't resist the temptation as an ex-English teacher to draw your attention to the extra apostrophe in the phrase. So apologies for that, but oh, obviously all the all yeah, happens the, die hard. The fourteen so, fifteen figure is for a partial year. Covalent doesn't have a spell check, but maybe we could uh, suggest an improvement on that particular one. So well caught out, thank you. Um, I think the, the whole professional update process, um, again, we know we have targets. We've been reporting an under target here for some time. It's something that the director is constantly reminding us that clearly it's picked up at the chief executive's one to one. We are assured by our schools that the process has taken place and when we've done audit spot checks, the paperwork is there but it's not uploaded onto iTrend, which is this, where this report comes from. So we know we've got administrative processes to improve on, but the other, I think, the reason for the drop will be the introduction for professional updates. All teachers are required to re-register with the DPC every five years. They are required to have a professional update process. They weren't really ready to do that until January or February. They all had their training in November. So this will be the month where all of DRDs are being done in the new professional update process. So I think that's the first thing that I'm hopeful to see improvement through. Secondly, our additional support for learning review will make clearer some of our line management arrangements for our peripatetic staff. And that again has been a, an area where we need to improve if you're working around three or four schools, who is responsible for Perhaps a gap some staff fell through, and I'm looking to close that gap. That, that's an area for me. Um, Andy? Um, th thanks, Chair. Uh, two things uh, for you, Chair, for Gillian. One was the thing about the P, um, PBRs, the staff. Um, what about the non teaching staff? Uh, that's the first. For, and the second, but just to see it coming back in place, uh, to pick up on Alistair, uh, Councillor Witz's point, um, thanks for the reassurance about the employability side. I'm more interested in the side where uh, they send youngsters to higher or further education and they don't complete their course. What stats do we have on that? I hate this question. 
the point regarding PDRs is all staff. That's a statistic for all staff. And I do think that the, the job of work now is getting on teaching staff on board. We don't have particularly good data in terms of attrition rates in university. Um, we are working with the Crichton Regional Observatory to try and get that dropout rate. We have anecdotal evidence from 10 years ago that we had one of the highest dropout rates from any university in the country. But we don't know where that came from. So we've got Glasgow University looking at their own, because all the universities can report on their own youngsters, but they're not necessarily very keen to publish their dropout rates. So that's certainly something we are, we, we funded a summer school for the last 10 years with the absolute aim to improve those staying on rates. That summer school was privately funded and the funders want the evidence to show whether or not it's had an impact and it's been very, very difficult to get that data. So we've got qualitative evidence that the youngsters have found it very beneficial, but we don't have the dropout rate. But we are, ultimately we could use an FOI and that's at the point where we're at at the moment. But I don't necessarily want to go down that route. I would rather get the information from the youngsters. Come. Thank you, Chair. It's just actually a point on the way the figures are presented. I'm sure I've brought this up before at a previous meeting. Um, it, it doesn't make it really very clear how well you're doing if you don't know what the target actually expresses. I mean, if you go to page 31, take the very first one, target 50. 50 of what? Because, I mean, 48.2 out of 50 looks really good, but what are we trying to achieve with the 50? Because further down, it's got 100. And you would think that's 100%, but then you've got 104.3, which means it can't be 100%. Um, there's, the targets just don't reflect to me what, what, what would the, it would be better if you had a column that said possible or target 50 of the maximum. So you can say, well, that target seems quite okay, or that target seems very low. And then you can actually put the value against the target and see what the maximum achievable would be and you get a better idea of actually where you are. Do you follow me? Yep. Yep, I think this was brought up at the last time, and uh, there's two pieces of primary care. The first one is primary one standardised assessment has a, a national average of 50, which is different to all the other standardised assessments from PC upwards. So that was one thing we identified last time, that we did the changes to the new business plan period um, to make them all the same at 100. So that's one discrepancy that we will um, arrange for tomorrow's time. The other thing is that surveillance isn't very friendly at allowing you to put more information about targets and normal ranges and things like that in. So um, it would be suggested that a, a company report on standardised assessments and the sort of average ranges and what is good and what is bad and maybe even some colour coding with that to accompany the covalence report might be useful. Yeah. I'll, I'll highlight what the, some work that Gwyneth has done recently with the schools on exactly that point that the schools have found very helpful to say that anything below 85 is coloured red. You were looking at whether it was good or whether it's bad. 100 is absolutely you know, the average. But if it's below 85, then you would be looking for an individual result for an individual pupil for, to have some intervention for that and above 115 would be considered quite exceptional. So those are the two ends of this, like the distribution. And the work that Gwen has done has identified for individual <coughs> pupils that should be targeted and we should replicate that for the next year. Jim McCollum. Thank you, Chair. Page 45. I'm looking for clarification of the statement which appears under the heading resource implication. Continuation of project initiated by graduate trainee and rollout of Tableau. Could you please explain what that means? Um, looking at the standardised assessment, um, primary schools in particular um, wanted to look at the standardised assessment um, as pupils went through the different cohorts in school. Now that, um, from our point of view, was a, a huge project because we've got over 10,000 pupils in primary school and to change that data as they went through to make it friendly to look at was something that we didn't have the capability to, to do. So we, we um, did through a, a, a research project using GradWorks 
who um, looked at different vehicles that we could use. We went back with actual producers of the standardised assessment um, who um, engaged in a project with us that they used our data and their capabilities, data visualisation tools that allowed us to look at different cohorts of people at class level, people level, um, area level, partnership school level, things like that, and made it easy to visualise. And that is something that's ongoing. Um, we don't have the graduate anymore, but we are still working with them to, um, to progress that project. And they are working on it from their point of view as well. But they now have on their website, starting with the T1, a user mechanism of looking at the data where support is paper-based. Now they can go on and have like different menu options, like looking at looked after children, looking at producers that are in the same areas, things like that. So it's easy to view and get an understanding of the tool. Did that answer your question or not? So I take it, it it's an easier form yeah. of data presentation. It is. Thank you. We've got no further speakers, so can we move to uh, the recommendation? Uh, members are asked to 2.1, review your overall summary performance. Okay with that? We have reviewed it. 2.2, I think we've uh, scrutinised the exception quality. Two point three. Note the summary of target setting benchmark for those just bought the business plan for two thousand sixteen. Okay, thank you. Move to uh, item eight, Dumfries Learning Town, Langland School. So it's a continuation of the, uh, the progress um, in terms of uh, delivering the uh, Dumfries Learning Town project. So we've got, I think, principally Annie Johnson to speak to this, so accompanied by Claire and uh, Luke. So is there anything you want to add to this, Annie? Okay. The members? Gail? Thank you, Chair. Um, it's going back to a point that I think I made at the March committee um, where I asked for reassurances that the autism provision and what was originally to be a special school, as I recall a few years ago, um, doesn't get sort of lost in the whole Langland uh, new complex in the northwest campus. And I'm afraid, according to this report, it's very much got soaked up in everything else. And, and I've read it and I've reread it, and, and I. I it's, it's now beginning to sort of suggest that the head teacher of the new Langland School, it's got the autism spectrum disorders, all within the same paragraph. There's no mention of um, the reassurances that I was given about locations that hadn't been agreed yet or, you know, across the region. And, and it just seems to me that this is a sort of backdoor way of just plonking it all in at, at Langland. And I, I really need reassurances that that's not the case because I know we've still got kids who are being taken to Ayrshire, to South Lanarkshire, into very specialist provision um, in very quiet locations because that's what they need. Um, and I don't want to see this getting soaked up in one great big project and not actually delivered. Um, and I'm not seeing it in this report. Okay. Claire, do you want to come in first? And then can carry on. Thank you, Chair. And apologies for the confusion. I think we worked to be very clear that the land report does not inflict any. Um, mention of whether it's about the children in the complex who are assigned to Langland who may, according to their many diagnoses, have a level of autism diagnosed as part of the range of challenges the school are working with them. With respect to the provision for autism, I think it's um, fair to reiterate that that's a separate piece of work which education services are being forced to serve at a very few issues at the moment. This is not just an education issue, this is a support and delivery issue and I completely acknowledge the concern of that is absolutely right, which is why this is a separate work stream and a separate solution, which we acknowledge the very point of view. Chair, again, I was just for, for Councillor McGregor, absolute reassurance from the director this is not uh, this is not soaking up or a back way to bring in the autism provision. Any, any plans for autism will come to you, sir. Alison? 
Thanks, Chair. I'm particularly interested in how this new uh, project will interface with provision uh, in terms of um, the delivery in the crossover from primary schools to children to secondary. And specifically, I have anecdotal evidence, and I have no particularly firm, not firm evidence, it's anecdotal, but um, children are often um, uh, over the primary school age are at Scotch Sound and, and even beings at uh, Langland. Provision is perceived as not fit to deliver what is their current need. Now, first of all, as you know, there's no anecdotal evidence of this that I've been with. <laughs> Secondly, um, if there is a difficulty in the crossover point to the to the Langland, will this need to be the new Langland addressed? Complexities um, before the left and it's very complicated and very complicated to try and understand the complaints. But the majority of the complaints seem to be that there is um, there is mistakes so you have children beyond primary years that actually need to be able to come back out. Um, and it really is difficult for young people to learn without real resources. So Langland has traditionally been assisted with children with um, hearing complex, particularly around that transition period from primary to secondary era. But again, I'd emphasise the fact that it's really around the, the need as a learner and where the best place, both in terms of the physical environment, but also the um, the teaching capacity as well in terms of the appropriate skill set. What we see is an opportunity for things on the new campus. We have very excellent established centres, but which will remain in the new campus, both at Lockdown and Maxton. And then by bringing the um, hearing complex into the Langland model, spoke about sharing the same and facilities where that is appropriate, but it's really about focusing on the needs of the learner and their specific um, complexities that they face all the time. No more speakers, so can we move to uh, the recommendations? Uh, 2.1, note the current position with regards to the condition of the current Langland building. Details of 3.1, noted. 2.2, note the related content of the recently agreed strategy for education provision for children and young people with autism spectrum disorders, hearing complex learning difficult emotional and behavioral needs in Vince Priest and Galloway that detailed at 3.2. 2.3, note that education committee agreed on 27th of January 2015 to proceed with a statutory consultation on the proposal to create a new Northwest Dumfries campus as detailed at 3.3 and 2.4. Agree that a statutory consultation should be over undertaken during 2015-16 in relation to the proposed relocate, relocation of Langland School to a new facility at the Northwest Campus. Part of the statutory consultation proposal outlined at 3.3. Okay. Okay. So if we move to. Uh, Item nine, Priest's Learning Town project update, and Claire's going to uh, give us a uh, press release. Okay, Claire. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Frank will be leading on this paper, so we'll, um, I'll let Frank do the preamble. I just want to lead on the presentation aspect, which is the first recommendation, if that's okay. Yeah, good morning, Chair. Uh, I just would like to share with everyone the, uh, the, the, the marvellous progress that we have been making with respect to the Dumfries schools. Uh, in recent months, what we've presented to the Edu Education Committee, uh, in some respects, that the focus has been on Dalbiti and the fact that we're very close to getting that particular project on site. Uh, we want to bring evidence to the committee today to demonstrate that the, the Dumfries solution is also making marvellous progress. Uh, and to evidence that, if the committee would agree to a very short presentation from Claire, to share with you some design images that are being progressed and worked through the design process. 
happy to receive the presentation. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Many thanks. I think we felt it was important to have some visuals um, because I know we've been speaking about increased learning time for a long time. And while we're working very hard behind the scenes, you know, some people might question what we're doing. It's important that we evidence that. I think we also want to respond to the points that elected members have made to us in the past about making sure that you're well informed and that you have the information in advance about going into wider arenas so that, you know, if people do ask you questions, then you are well versed to respond to them as well. Um, again, we just want to just quickly just go over, you know, what we're doing and how we're structuring it. So under phase one, we're looking at the learning hub, which includes space for children with behavioural and short term needs, which was formerly accommodated at Elm Bank. We're looking at the Northwest Cluster, which was Maxleton, Lockside and St Ninians, along with community facilities coming onto the Allower Road site. We're looking at the redevelopment of St Joseph's College, and as we've just spoke about um, in the previous paper, the relocation of Langlands to the Northwest Campus. We're also planning and taking up the design stage, because we feel that's very important that this is a whole town solution. Um, that we're planning for the Northeast Cluster, which is Dumfries High School, Noble Hill, and David Keswick. The Central Cluster, which is Dumfries Academy, Lower Burn, and looking at a solution for Laurie now. And Frank will go into that just after the presentation. And we're planning and designing those at the stages, so you'll have presentations for all of them eventually. We don't have all the information here today, but we want to give you what we've got around phase one. What we have been doing is engaging in a lot of site visits. We've had parents and we've had teachers and parent councils out to again to get them out there to look at community facilities, look at new facilities to demonstrate what new learning environments could or should be incorporating community aspect, but also in a new build and a refurbishment perspective. And again, these are throughout Scotland and given an idea of the context of you know what could a learning classroom in the Academy or St Joseph's look like here? Um, how could we use the infill spaces, particularly in the redevelopment campuses, to create innovative social space? And social space is a big thing that we hear back from our learners. How could we create what is a very architectural and impressive building in the Minerva into something that's more light, more engaging, more user-friendly? Again, there's lots of good examples of new builds out there. A lot of bad things, a lot of good things, but what we want to do is learn lessons and take the best for our school. Some nice new examples closer to home in the Ayrshire's. Again, give you a sense of what the early years of nursery could look like. And again, everybody's really engaging and they the engagement from teachers and parents is really good, and they're also acting as ambassadors about what Dumfries Learning Time will deliver. Again, lots of good examples. I just want to say we are doing a lot of site visits to engage with everybody. What we've come down to, and this is just um, this is a plan for the Northwest. What we've taken is a lot of the learning from the Dalbeek campus and created this cross model. Now, this is quite an important model in terms of minimising travel distance for our early years primary community and secondary colleagues and young people, but maximising natural daylight, natural ventilation, increased social space. So it's a model that we've seen at Dumfries that works very well and we've brought it over to Northwest, but also acknowledging that Northwest has its own personality, its own needs, and looking about how we can actually innovatively um, respond to what they're looking at. So still we've got the shared entrance, which I've just got the, the, the mouse point there, but the ability to break down the early years, primary, secondary, and the community separately for security purposes. We've got um, our early years wings. So again, looking at how we can create effective transition between nursery and primary, about being able to shut down the building separately, it needs to be separate, but also allowing the benefits from early years going up to the secondary to get languages education, to get um, science education. Having this nice central core here, but again, that can work very um, well in terms of bringing the whole school together for assemblies, but also innovative arts, performance, drama, social space, catering space. Looking at the wing, the, the, the bottom of the diagram, and that's looking about the community facility, about saying how do we really promote the excellent work, particularly in Northwest around the sports hub, having really nice conversations about all the community groups, um, but equally acknowledging that, that that part of the building could op operate separately, separate times of the day or in evenings. And again, sort of looking, this is, this is the, the ground floor plan of this area. So we've got our wings in terms of, to the right, we've got nursery, primary. To the top, we've got primary. To the south, to the bottom, we've got the community wing. And then to the, to the left um, or west of the screen, then we're looking at the secondary accommodation. And what Annie is very, very effectively doing at the moment is working with all the subject specialists. So we've got the home economics teachers involved. We've got the math teachers involved. So we've got a lot of the subject specialists really starting to define their 
their accommodation requirements. And this is how it's going to look on the site. We've done a lot of work in terms of site investigation and consultation with the community. Um, so if you look at the right-hand side of this diagram, that's taking you in from the A76 onto the Alloa Road. You know, a big aspect about moving this campus was to give it a sense of community presence, put it at the heart of the community, but also make it more visible and more accessible. We want our learners to stay in our community wherever possible, and we really want the community to be, be visible and accessed and permeable. We know that's a challenge for site. We know we've got contaminated land. We know we've got culvert issues. We thought we had archaeological issues, but we don't anymore. But everybody's still, still very keen to keep Telly Tubbly Hillam. And that's up to the community. That's what they're wanting. So we're promoting and supporting that. Um, but this is looking about how this building will fit in the context of the site. Hopefully you can see that even with our building on it, it's still a very huge site. We know the tree planting and the playground areas are very important to the community. And we want to retain and move them to support what we're doing with the campus. But equally looking at synthetic pitch and grass facilities. We're, again, we're working closely with community football clubs about what their needs are, but trying to make that site a much better, more impressive sense of pride in the community because we've got the facilities that are accessible. So that's where we're at in terms of developing the Northwest Campus. Then we're starting to look at the sort of more innovative design around the hub, and I'm going to get Vanessa just to pop up for a minute just to have a wee chat, just around how this is starting to pan out and what we're looking to include in the hub, again, to give you a sense of the work that we've done, but also what the prize is at the end of all this. Similarly here with the hub, this is looking at the ground floor, um, two-storey building at present. Um, a big thing about the hub is actually about celebration, about celebrating the learning that takes place in Plymouth Reef, but also how the hub facilities can actually be um, an entrance point to the rest of John Peter Galloway. We, it's very, very clear from elected members that the hub facilities, the services that it provides, actually give opportunities for people to cross the water. On the ground floor, we're looking at um, hospitality facilities, open cafe, large performance yes. space. We're looking at bespoke facilities in terms of um, automotive, metalwork, woodwork. We're also looking at new innovation spaces. What we're trying to do with the hub facility is actually look at where is technology going to, going to go, what types of facilities and technology do we not have capacity to put within our four secondary schools, but can have in a central hub location. On the second floor of the hub, um, again, we are looking at the, the central areas. We are looking for specific high-quality science labs. But the way we're looking at the building is actually to to design it in a way that we have spaces that allow one-to-one -one sessions for those pupils that need that level of support. One to five, ratios one to 10, all the way up to one to 33. And the reason for that is that this facility is not purely a student play facility, it's actually a So we need to build the space and design the space in such a way to be able to accommodate the full primary care. We're looking at innovation in the design and particularly in regards to science. How can we actually open up science without glazed walls in between the high spec science labs that normally we would be restricted for, for, for pupils of an earlier age going into, but so they can actually see and engage in live learning. Another key aspect that we're working and looking at at the moment is how we join this technology-wide. As I said, it's a, a read and write facility. So we're also looking at how we can record lessons and practice and performance by young people and by teachers and therefore how we can share that across um, our network through GLOW and other um, internet sources. <laughs> I shouldn't mention GLOW, should I? Sorry. Um, so that obviously it can benefit all of our teachers, but also learners. A big part of the, the vision for the hub is actually also about creating spaces that young people can themselves manage and can develop their own paths for learning. So it's really important that the hub meets those, I think, really high expectations that, that the young people have, and the teachers have tasked us with. So, and here are just the first internal images that have started to come through. As I say, it's the first render through, so it is, um, it, needs, it still needs some work, but what's really important is we have proper visuals that we can go out and show people, because people are needing to see and feel things. And a lot of people really struggle in terms of understanding plans, so we're trying to make everything as readable as possible. So again, it's that sense of what's possible, that showcasing, that celebration of what Vanessa said, 
But that glimpse of, you know, you see a scientist at work and you're like, okay, well, what's that? What do they do? I want to be one of them. So it's really wanting to inspire both our young learners but also our communities. Um, and then we're starting to map it onto our, our, our sites to see how it's going to work and fit again. You know, there's lots of discussions. You know, we're in discussions with planners, roads, floods. There's so many different aspects to this ongoing. But what is important, and I'm sure very important to elected members, is about our engagement. You know, we're heavily in, you know, Frank, Annie, Lindsay and the team are very involved both with the technical team but in the schools, speaking with the teaching staff, speaking with the learners. Vanessa's been doing a lot of innovative engagement. We had Stephen Heppel back up and he was in all the primary schools last Monday and Tuesday to really challenge them to say, think differently. Lots of good examples coming out of Denmark at the moment, which we're really talking about in terms of stages of learning. But a really big push over for the summer term, which is eight weeks, in terms of really getting the information, because we're starting to get visuals out there. Um, we're also working with parent councils. We've started joint parent council meetings. Um, we met Noble Hill and um, Duffy's High School a couple of weeks ago. We're setting up Lower Burnham Academy. So starting to bring people together to have quite exciting conversations. Um, I think the big focus is around the work that Annie's going to be doing in terms of statutory consultation, which will be starting on the 1st of June. Um, so a lot of pu public meetings which we'll make you aware of obviously getting to the area committees is very important as well for us and we're having a Dumfries Learning Town Week which will start Saturday the 13th of June it will finish before Good Neighbours um, not the 20th as it says up there we don't want to clash with Good Neighbours um, and basically we're doing a roadshow we'll, we'll have a town centre location on the 13th and then during that following week on a day by day basis we'll go into school we're there from 9 till 9 um, we'll have visuals, and it's not just visuals for the individual school, it's about Dumfries Learning Town. Everybody has an interest in every aspect of what we're doing, so we'll be promoting that at every school. We've also been working with parent councils who have agreed that they will promote it at their fun days, their events, and we'll support where we can as well. So every one of the primary and secondary schools and special schools in Dumfries will have all the visuals to show to their learners, teachers and parents as well and we'll get around them as well. So a real push over the next two months to um, promote what we're doing, where we're at and what the visuals are looking at and most importantly give everybody a chance to comment. Um, so that's our um, presentation. Just to say we have links, the Schools for the Future East newsletter is going out termly. We do have links for Dumfries Learning Town on the website and we're promoting that through emails. Um, the termly letters going out as well. So we're doing everything that the parents asked us to do um, and we're going to every parent council meeting. So there's a lot going on, which hopefully you will hear through some form of communication. Um, I would like to pass back to Frank now, who'll just go through the, the main aspects of the paper. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, in respect of item 2.2, uh, we would ask committees to note the extensive building surveys that have been going on can reference one or two of them, whether it be geotech, structural, rot, m and &E, roof, fabric, etc. The list does go on and on. Uh, surveys have been both visual and intrusive. Uh, we took the, the window of the Easter break to actually get into schools and that start knocking holes in floors and walls and roof spaces so that we fully understand the condition of all our school estates. Uh, now, why that is so important, because the gathering of that information uh, can influence the optimum design for particular schools. So that has been quite an extensive exercise involving lots of resources over all the schools. And that chapter in the, 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 the story is, is now complete. And it is informing design here. Uh, in respect of 2.3, uh, developing design briefs. Uh, again, there's massive engagement with all the schools, stakeholders, teachers, pupils, parent councils, uh, and that is a big demand on resource. Uh, we are just about coping, but some really exciting designs and, and ideas are emerging from it. And again, you know, in the fullness of time, we will be able to bring to committee the fruits of our uh, endeavours in terms of definitive design. In respect of item 2.5, uh, we'd ask the committee to, to look at the, the two options that, that had been previously tabled in respect of both David Keswick Centre 
and at Laurie Now Primary School. They had both been predicated on the refurbishment of the existing spaces. Uh, where the condition surveys have revealed a far greater deterioration in the condition of both buildings than had been previously envisaged. If I could reference committee members to fundamental things like all m and &E services require complete replacement. Now, that is quite fundamental. So when things like that started to be teased out and things like, you know, roofs are in a very, very poor state of rep repair, but they require replacement, we started looking at, is this best value for money? And the other issue that we had on both sides was that the existing floor plates on both are too big. So how do you scale down that existing facility to align with your space requirements? At what point do you, you know, cut off a part of the building to still give you that functionality? That all created big challenges for us. And when we prepared the actual analysis of new build versus, or sorry, refurb, as had been the case, to, to new build, on the face of it, new build certainly gives best value for money. So we'd ask that the committee uh, approves progression with us working up new build options for both sites. I think it is important to reference that, you know, we have every wish to respect legacy issues in respect of David Keswick. We have been in contact with Hollywood Trust to give them assurances that said legacy issues would be respected for whatever, whatever the, 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 the potential new build solution would be. And finally, Chair, we do ask that you receive a further report on the phase two schools uh, in a six-month period. Look, looking at the, the the schedule as it stands just now, Chair, that will probably come in a little bit uh, sooner than six months. And we're probably looking at about end of August, September time, when we can come back to committee to, to give a you know, the, the more definitive update in terms of design solutions, in terms of cost, and in terms of program. But we are really getting, you know, in an exciting period of time at Dobbies. As I referenced earlier, Dobbies has been to date potentially the jewel in the crown. We have another jewel in the crown emerging here at Dobbies. Everybody's working very hard, yeah, and we are going to get there. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I think because you know, we can sense the uh, the momentum is picking up in terms of the uh, the project. And I think everybody's getting involved now. And actually, at least see the what's where where where, where we're starting with in terms of uh, starting. When's the earliest construction phase? Really, because that's obviously one of the main questions being asked. Chair, if I could reference the phase one schools and to remind everyone that's the learning hub. St. Joe's and uh, Lockside or Maxwellton. Uh, that should start in the summer of next year, the current programme. Thank you, Chair. Okay, so I'll throw it open for Paul. Questions? Thank you, Chair. Um, I've made my support known many times in the past for workshops, etc., for non academic students, and I'm very pleased to hear that these have been. Um, talked about today, um, I would just like some assurance that, that these will be absolutely fit for purpose. Um, we have a, a brand new um, workshop at Kirkcudley Academy for which we're all very grateful, um, but by the time you fit a couple of cars in there, there's hardly any room for any students. So um, it really does need a little bit more thought put into it than what we had at Kirkcudley, because I mean, it's the rector themselves that takes the classes and he says he can't get enough kids in the class, so um, some definite thought for that. Do you? I, I'll bite my tongue about the size of the workshop at Kukubri. Um, the There's a most definite uh, resolve to make sure that the, the accommodation in the hub is fit for purpose, and we're taking advice from a, you know, a number of, of specialists in that area. But beyond that, we're also wanting to develop it in tandem with what is already on offer at Dumfries and Galloway College and what will be available to us at Car Cargan Bridge Depot in terms of work placements and extending the facilities. 
So it will be one of several high tech uh, and I think flexible spaces that will be available to youngsters who are pursuing that line of, uh, of interest. Equally, we want to make sure that youngsters, no matter what their destination, if they're moved through the hub, get tasters of different kinds of work and different kinds of pathways. So there'll be different opportunities for youngsters to have that both in the hub and in these other facilities. Andy? Um, th thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm obviously pleased to see this moving forward at a rate of knots. Um, just so I've got this right in my own head, um, Annie, who's sent up the back, came to Matt Ty two weeks ago, two months ago now, it would be with plans um, very early drawn. Um, the, the drawings that you showed today, that Mark II version, am I right? Because the original ones had um, new line lines actually included. So it's the plan to have new line lines included in the Mark II setup, like the, the, the conjoined part. In which case then we'd be moving um, the new line lines from phase two to phase one. Fair enough. Right? I can understand the rationale for that. Um, but I'm actually, more than anything else, really pleased to see that uh, the department has taken on the views of the parents and the partner organisations. And that's my last little question on this. Um, is there sufficient room in the proposed drawings for the market and development to include the community assets and community partners that have been so integral in reviving Matai? Chair, uh, in terms of design development, uh, you know that we go through various iterations. W what what you've seen today isn't the final, not by any manner of means. We should get a good insight into the final solution in respect of Max, Max High uh, on the 15th of June. That's when our stage one submission is due from our supply chain partner. And that will give pretty definitive drawings uh, and pretty definitive course and timelines in respect to bills. Uh, it will all be very, also be very prescriptive in respect of accommodation schedules. And we will ensure that all the engagement that we've had it will be captured in that design solution. That will be shared with elected members. Uh, thanks for letting me back in, Chair. So that will include things like the library, um, community policing, uh, leisure and sport, with their own dedicated facility as opposed to getting stuck in a room together. Yes, um, we're taking forward the development of the community library um, with representatives from each of the schools and also from public library service. So it's a, we're um, going to put out in a visit fairly soon to an existing school with a community library and it's sort of like staff to talk to the, the operational support of that. But that is included in the, the new design um, in terms of Light and sport, yes. Again, we've been meeting with the community sports hub and representatives of light and sport to ensure that we have the design of that right. Um, it will be, like Claire mentioned earlier, we'll be able to lock down the leisure and sport facilities further, which will be accessible um, out with the school opening. I should also say the community library as a library aspect is designed so that <coughs> you can access it without having to go through the rest of things have been taken into consideration and there is also a partner and learning office which is specifically for youth by for the community library to ensure that that is accessible so we have pieces in NHS and, and that's been worked out as well Alison Thank you Chair uh, I appreciate the description of the hub and that's absolutely right that um, uh, facilities that are not readily available in the schools and technical facilities can be delivered from the hub and that is that was my understanding of one of the main purposes of the hub uh, however there's other aspects as well I'm just seeking reassurance that for assurance that uh, uh, another 
important first function of the hub would be to draw together um, pupils from the sector who chose those subjects, which are not, because of the numbers, uh, not deliverable in individual secondary schools. So that would be students. But that is also a, a function, going to be a function. Dougal? Yeah, I can give you that assurance. Uh, you know, quite categorically, one of the one of the exercises we've been undertaking is to uh, survey the youngsters who are currently going through the senior phase to look at the kind of subject options that they would look, be interested in exploring. So uh, we we're beginning to get an idea of those subjects that might actually be developed in the hub, new subjects as well as some of the existing subjects at a more advanced level. Dick. Yeah, it's good to see progress been made in the and modern education facilities is going to be available for our students in the future. I just want a couple of assurances. I've asked this question before. Uh, uh, the preferred site for, for the learning hub uh, of all the issues regarding the common good land, etc., and permissions to build have been sorted out. I'd like to update, update on that. And also, I'm just looking at the size of the lorry now provision, which Get reading it right. There's 363 places, primary places available there. Uh, this this seems quite a, a large unit to meet children's need, needs. There was a meeting last week of where at at Musold where the, they've only got two pupils and obviously we're not meeting all their needs there. And I'm wondering whether the this the size of this campus is really going to meet the needs of the children there. We're, we're following it. An agenda where we want to improve the lives of people from poorer backgrounds. Uh, I'm just interested to look at the figures earlier in the agenda uh, on the uptake of free meals. Uh, the largest school in Annan has a 77% uptake of free, of free meals, but smaller schools in the area in East Riggs and Annan had over 90% uptake. So, is, is this campus really the, the optimum size? for meeting the needs of, of our children. Yeah, yeah. Firstly, in respect of uh, the learning hub, the, the plan is that it is located at the King George V site. There's no change there. Uh, as committee knows, Chair, there are issues around the designation of that land being common good, uh, and colleagues in legal services are progressing that matter on our behalf. I think there's an, up due, an update due uh, during the summer recess. Uh, in respect of Laurie Now, the, the Laurie Now brief in terms of space is very prescriptive in that it's uh, 2891 square metres, and that's what the, the new build option gives us in respect of the preferred option three. So, yes, it will be deliver a space that aligns with pupil roles. Uh, the question was not about the size of the school, but the optimum uh, number of of uh, children there to make sure that we're meeting their needs and we're not and we're giving them a good education where they're treated as individuals. Uh, Chair, thanks. I, th I think it's a really good point that the council raises. Um, if one was starting again, and if you were to raise all of the buildings, you know, to start from the very very beginning right across from Fleece and Galloway, we wouldn't have schools that range from 1,200 to 2. So there, there's no doubt at all that one could argue what an optimum size of secondary and primary might be. But equally, we need to accommodate what's currently there. And one of the issues is, um, in terms of the statutory consultation and new builds and relocations, is one of the things is you, by and large, have to accommodate the kids who currently attend schools. So it's not as if we can just take every school and start again and say, let's build so many at 200. So we have to look at what's already there. Um, I, I think it's true to say that what we want to do is try to avoid extremes. And therefore, whilst building lorry now is in relation to the historic uh, numbers that attend the school, and that's something we're committed to, you'll see in a future paper uh, that we're about to look at in a few minutes' time that we're trying to look at secondary schools and get a sort of optimum size around that. Because I agree with you, we don't want any schools that are far too big. We clearly don't want any schools. Small, but we need to be pragmatic about what's already in place. Peter? 
Thank you, Chair. Um, very much welcome the um, development of the vocational side of the, uh, the, the hub and everything. Um, I was just wondering, I, I think it's a great opportunity to develop links with local businesses and one thing or another to promote learning. And I was just wondering to what degree, you touched on it earlier, what degree this is going to happen to promote the practical sort of learning side. Google? Uh, we, we've, we've got a lot of interest from, from local employers and organisations in, in involvement in the hub. And what we've tried to do is to look at current examples uh, of, of, bus of business and education partnerships in different parts of the country as to how we might get somebody to come and give us some guidance on how best to pursue this. And it seems that the, the company Siemens, which you know, is based in, has a big base, a vocational and training base in Newcastle, has a very strong program there. So we're, we're, we're looking at working with Siemens and getting them to come across and describe to us how best to do it so that we, we're not trying to, to replicate some of this, but we're learning from other people's lessons. So yes, the, the plan is to have greater involvement than ever before, but we want to do it properly. So we're learning lessons from other people and we'll get guidance from them. Would it be possible for members to come to that meeting as observation ob observers? The answer to that is absolutely yes. I mean, it will be, it'll be more than an invitation. It will be, it'll be a very warm invitation because it's something that you know, we would very much w w want you to be part of. Um, we have actually identified two dates in September, uh, the 29th and the 30th. We're going to have two days of engagement with um, parents, young people, and the business sector. Um, these dates were actually only just confirmed yesterday. And we're looking to work with, again, uh, Professor Stephen Heppel in terms of uh, learning and teaching, uh, Martin Hotas in terms of Siemens, uh, and also with our colleague Graham Norris, formerly of Education Scotland. Um, in addition to that, as well as obviously working with partners from out with the authority, we are getting incredible support already from local banks within Dumfries about how they can actually support learning for children and for parents. Um, Lawburn Housing are very keen to be a partner how they can support young people in terms of independent learning and life skills. So we are looking at um, pulling together a lot of the interested part parties, but also obviously making sure that that is an open invitation um, so that the, that is an open invitation. Could I ask that member, uh, members' involvement might be on the 30th of September rather than 29th because it's full council unless we can have a very short agenda. Yeah, I think it's very true there's a lot of uh, interest from commerce and uh, industry to get involved in this at the very early stage. It's something which, you know, we really need to be there to work on. Break down this sort of bar barrier between learning and, uh, and work. Uh, Rob? Thanks, Chairman. Yeah, it's nice to see Dobby be um, setting a design trend. There was much in the design there that I, that I recognise. Um, question was, though, I, I wasn't sure if I'd seen it in the plan or not, but my eyesight's terrible. Will we see at some point, given the previous paper, how um, the, the, the design and location of new Langlands will kind of interrelate with the campus? Because um, I think that will be important both for us to see and, and clearly for the, the parents and staff at Langlands as well. Chair, I think in respect to that, in terms of sharing information, I think uh, we talked about it, uh, we have talked about it over the last number of weeks, that we, when we get a definitive design that in respect of uh, the Learning Hub in North West of June the 15th. So at some point thereafter, we have a member seminar and we can really share designs with members and the accommodation schedules that, that go alongside the design solution. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. And as soon as possible after we get the uh, brief, we need to have the best solution. Colin? Thank you, Chair. It's just a follow on from Councillor Witts about the more specialised subjects that some people may wish to take up. Will that be rolled out across the region via video conferencing so that people don't need to travel into the fleet? I mean, I know it's been mentioned before, but I really would like some assurance that this will happen. Um, and also, would that be a timetabling issue for local schools? I mean, how would they, how would they be able to work that in? To take the second part of your question first, the, it, it, there will be a common timetable across, across the borough to enable schools that. And we would, en we would envisage that all schools across the police and Galloway would have sight of that and might want to alter their, their timetable timing in the light of that to enable youngsters to participate 
through video conferencing or Skype or, or any of the, the, the kind of handheld facilities that the youngsters now have. Uh, in addition to that, we're looking to have the hub operating you know, on a, on a much more flexible timetable than the school. So there'll be classes that will be offered there, twilight classes, after school evening classes, and Saturday morning classes. So that there might even be opportunities for youngsters who want to take up particular courses at times out with the school day, or additional courses, what's on their core curriculum, to actually do that at times other than, you know, the standard timetable. Andy? Um, thanks, Chair. Um, two, two things. Just to go back to the New Langlands again. I, I'm maybe making an assumption here, but I'm assuming the New Langland School will use the main entrance the same as everyone else. Thanks to that there won't be. It's on. I'm saying that the, the New Langlands, um, the pupils who attend New Langlands will, will come in through the exactly the same entrance as every other pupil, but rather be segregated se 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 out. Um, what I would say is it's, it's, it's having a flexible design that you can accommodate individual interests and equally accommodate all of coming together. We find that definitely through the development of the single school for BT and it's supported by the North West. Is the school very very much want the flexibility of bringing all this cohort together when that's appropriate, but equally having individual entrances. So it might be in terms of the new language that we have an individual entrance, but we have a common entrance as well. For example, they might be doing a lot of um, external um, visits to museums and that will require a lot of access and transport. So we need to have an ex a separate um, entrance and exit for them. But equally the ability for everybody to a single entrance, and that has certainly been supported by the parents, the learners, and the staff. But that is what we need. Is that complex? I'm sorry for you, Chair. Is that completely the same as you? Um, uh, uh, multi agency um, agreed across all political parties in Scotland years ago as the way to household with a learning disability. Um, that they should be entitled to exactly the same as everyone else, they should be treated exactly the same as you, which is what it's meant. Um, but I mean, if, if we can. Talk about that later. That's fair enough. Um, the second thing we, um, I was going to ask you about was about Laurie now. Um, has anyone spoken to the Scottish Prison Service? Because the last time they made a major political policy change, they put the, the sex offenders looking overlooked in the primary school, and then they had to rechange it again. So that wasn't our fault. It breakdown. It was their breakdown in communication. But are we making sure that we're um, we're speaking to them to make sure that? Uh, that that's been taken into account. Chair, the, the, the design solution that has been progressed or has been looked at in respect to Laurie now is sympathetic and acknowledges the fact uh, of the prison adjacency. I just haven't spoken on this one yet. Um, a lot of positive work, obviously, and, and commend the officers for getting on with a great job. How are we paying for it? Um, we've got some additional costs here involved with the David Tegart Centre that we hadn't anticipated. There's, there's, you know, I think we were sitting somewhere in the region of about 93 million last year. And apart from, I'm looking back at the papers, um, one item that's seen our in November, we haven't really had any indication of actually how we're going to pay for this. And I, I, I think it's possible for members fairly quickly to get some indication of costs of both phase one and phase two. I mean, you're saying that we, we're going to start phase one in 2018. <laughs> and I don't know how we're paying for that at the moment. Um, so I think you know we, we need a, a report at some point fairly quickly to outline how we're actually going to manage to do this. Because I'd hate to get to a stage where we can't, we simply can't deliver it. Because that would be a disaster. Chair, um, if I can reference the in terms of our stage one submission, uh, namely definitive designs and costs, uh, the learning hub on Northwest Campus is due on the fifteenth. Uh, St. Joe's is a little bit behind that because of the extensive survey work that has been going on and that presents different design challenges that we're having to take on board. So that said, by the 21st of April, we will have the complete picture with the complete cost. That will generate a report that will come back to committee and will inform committee about how we're going to fund this. I think for the record, it is fair to say that there are cost pressures. Uh, and there's a cocktail of cost, cost pressures at the Northwest Campus. It's predominantly to do with what's under the ground, in that it was formerly the, the town dump, if you look at the historical drawings. So there's an issue there in terms of how you remediate that, and that's not cheap. Uh, in terms of 
St. Joseph's, and th this is the other cost pressure, the extent of or the, the condition of the building has deteriorated far, far more than anybody could ever have envisaged. So that obviously is creating a, cross, a cost pressure. Uh, we have a little bit of contingency monies, but obviously there's other things to come. Uh, but we should, by the end of August, have the complete picture. That will generate a report that we will bring back to the committee. August, okay. sorry. Ben? Um, just in terms of the wider funding package, I remind the committee that CNR did agree the funding package was the only one. And you're quite right in saying we don't have a funding package for phase two, but we start without this one just to ensure that we can meet the capital spending plan for the council. So we're absolutely focused on getting all this signed up for phase one. That gives a very clear idea of what the vision is and how we should spend and what the costs are. It's very clear that this is the only funding that's focused and available for phase one only. So are we looking for a further report to come to the, the September? Maybe on the basis of what time? Do you think? September, October, yeah. September or November, we haven't got a meeting yeah. in October. Yeah. Can we move to the uh, recommendations? Members are asked to 2.1, agree a presentation, which we've already had. And 2.2, note the com completion of extensive building survey and site investigation work at all of the project sites within phase two of the increased learning plan. 2.3, note the progress made on the development of the design brief of the school stakeholders for each of the phase two projects. 2.4, note the various design options for the phase two projects have been explored in order to determine the best solution in terms of education, delivery and value for money. 2.5, agree that new build design options are progressed in respect of David Physics Centre and Laurie Now Primary School is referenced in 3.8, agree. And 2.6, agree to receive a further report on the design proposals for the phase two projects within six months and the paper coming to the uh, September or November meeting Okay. Okay. So if we move on to item 10, the Dumfries Learning Town Cutting Paper. And Claire's speaking to you. And I don't know if you want to give a little bit of background to the, uh, the reason why this paper is coming to the uh, committee at this point, Claire. I think it might be. Uh, Chair, very, very happy to do that. Um, many thanks for all your questions to the previous two papers, and hopefully you can see the sense of the shape that the emerging out of Dumfries Learning Town and the fact that we are working very hard to um, deliver and get this project on the ground. I think what, what you might not see as, um, obviously, is a lot of the operational work streams. Vanessa and Dougald are certainly working very hard, um, as are all the staff across the schools around looking at common broad general education, looking at senior phase education, looking at travel and timetabling. So there's a lot of like governance management structures that have to sit around this because as we have and council mandated us to do, this is a collective vision for the education for all our children and young people from Ireland and Dumfries, but looking at benefit across the region as well and making sure that we give all our children and young people the best start in life by the widest range of learning experience and the widest range of subjects capitalising our resources across the council, Leisure and Sport, Arts Museums, but also a lot of our external, private and third sector partners as well. And on that basis, um, there's a lot of interim steps that can and are happening prior to the first schools opening in 2018. You know, Vanessa's working very hard in creating a GIS system whereby all learner journeys, all learning experiences can map through apps, through mobile technology, <laughs> looking at creating one timetabling system whereby all the schools are timetabling collectively together, looking to work in, towards a single senior phase. So aiming for August 2017, all our secondary schools are offering one set of subject choices. So there's a lot of work behind this which is supporting this overall creation of Dumfries Learning Town. And one item in relation to that is about capping the school rules. In this paper we talk about um, historic trends and numbers of schools also acknowledging the estate, the estate that we're working currently in doesn't match the needs of today. You know, we have huge capacities in there which will never be used again. And we are working to create a much more effective set of learning campuses across some Fries that will work together to provide the learner the best experience, but actually need to meet the needs of the, the demands of the demographics. 
we know that in order to do that, we need to start planning now so that we hit the ground running when we have the new facilities in 2018. And that's about looking about the numbers of our individual secondary schools and the cluster primaries that sit around that. And that's the, that's the essence of the paper that's here today. It's in support of everything that you've seen in the previous two papers, but giving you the reassurance and structure to say we need to start planning and implementing this now, along with all the other operational work streams. As has been said in the recommendations, this is the first step, capping, and then we'll start looking at the catchments and clusters. We know there's a lot of different directions of travel across Dumfries. We know Dumfries is a very unique scenario in terms of where the learners and parents choose. We know a lot of this is predicated on Victorian parish models, which may or may not, may or may not be relevant to the needs of our learners, our parents, society, communities, working patterns, childcare patterns today. And what we're trying to do with Dumfries Learning Town as in the capping paper is to make some sense of it. And this is the first step to really starting implementing what is the new direction of travel for a single focused vision for education for our learners across Dumfries. We acknowledge it is complex. There's a lot of figures attached to this and we felt it was important to give members sight of this. This is six months work with a team of people with a lot of other figures behind it. We're trying to give you a sense of the level the richness of what we've had to do to get to this point, but also the importance in this organisation, the step forward in delivering this key strategic programme. Happy to take questions on that, and hopefully that gives you a flavour of what this is about and how we've structured it. Thank you very much, members. I know it's a very difficult and complex um, you know, formally, you have to work to within this and for catchment for people numbers, no more so than in where the new buildings are going to be in uh, you know, the northwest area of Dumfries, because many parents have chosen not to send their children to schools within that area. And my worry would be is, you know, and, and I know that there's hundreds of people, you know, that don't attend these schools, don't send their kids to these schools and that. My worry would be that the, the schools are big enough and they have the opportunity to actually take more people in. Because when you get a new school, when you get such innovation within this is going to happen in uh, Dumfries, people's, you know, parents will choose to go to these schools, they will choose to send their children in. How, what kind of um, buffer have you got in there for, for that type of scenario? When we were looking at the figures, we know that we have a, a high percentage of pupils which actually even migrate out of Dumfries. So if we just look at the, the figures that we have in the report at present, we have a percentage in there that actually at the moment, as I say, leave Dumfries and that obviously will continue to, we presume, uh, continue their education outside of Dumfries. That gives us um, that buffer percentage. Uh, we also, in the um, outline business case, obviously identify pupil cohort. And again, in, in the figures that are presented in the capital paper, we have an addition in there which, um, across the four secondary schools, will then again um, migrate out. Sorry, does that answer your question? Partly, partly. But, you know, but, you know, the. I do know that, you know, I've had, it's, it's an exciting project and I've got to thank you all, which, uh, uh, you know, for all the hard work you've been putting in to the actual learning town and, you know, the, the energy you've still got to push forward. I don't know how you do it, but, the, you know, we have to get this right uh, and we have to bring, you know, the, the community aspect as well in here, but the, the people numbers, I still think, you know, just speaking from people, they are really excited about, you know, their kids going and their, their kids' kids going to the, these schools and that. And I just w worry that, you know, we've made provision for that type of movement away from other schools. And I know you're, you, when you're capping it and you're trying to get equal opportunities for every area, but, you know, I, I still, you know, if you're in that area, you're in that catchment area, and I've I'm just wondering about numbers there and the future numbers and if that's all we take care of. I know even, you know, if there's housing, there's new housing going up in North West Dumfries, there's Barn Hill and there's the new housing uh, at the top of Lockside that's still to be completed and uh, things like that. And I know that 
um, you know, you've got to make provision for that as well. But and it's a very difficult, and I don't envy that how to try and work that out in a formula. But you know, we, as near as we can, we've got to get this right. Thanks, Lida. Yes, it does hurt our heads a lot of the time, and we have spent a lot of time trying to work this out because it's important that what we're doing is demonstrable, it's auditable, but it's also listening to um, future trends and predictions and what parents and learners are looking for. So we've spent a lot of time on the historic trends, but then it's trying to factor in the lessons learned about the new build factor, as you say. <laughs> but part of this is wanting to create excitement in every school, whether it gets a new build or whether it doesn't get a new build. It's about, as you just said, that opportunities for all. It's about equality and parity, about every school. We are creating a whole town solution. And what we want to get to is regardless of the primary or secondary choice, that child, that young person has the same opportunities. And we need to, and we want to get away from labels from individual schools because it's about Dumfries Learning Town as a whole. It's about a, it's about a common approach to broad general education. It's about a common approach to transition. Um, in terms of the capping, it was also important to prevent, prevent and to help manage any temporary fluctuations in numbers where a cohort might want to go to a new build temporarily and then want to move elsewhere. So the part of the capping has got a reason for that in that respect. We have got capacity in terms of future demographics. You know, as Vanessa said, we do have cohorts going out of the region, but those numbers are, the region, sorry, the town, but they are still factored in our numbers. And we do, you never work on a design capacity of 100%, you work on a design capacity of 80%. So there's, there's physical capacity in there as well. If you wouldn't mind me just adding to that, um, I mean, I think the leader's absolutely spot on. It's been, this has been one of the, I was going to say one of the more challenging aspects, but it's been five or six years of quite challenging aspects. But th this, um, this issue about getting the sizes of the schools right and the issue about how we ensure that they've got roughly, not, not quite equal, but uh, uh, appropriate sizes of, of build has been very, very difficult. And, and, and we haven't, it hasn't been a tabletop exercise. I think we've used a lot of the data, but we've also tried to use a bit of intuition and a bit of using evidence that we've had from the past and a bit of looking at PPP when sometimes, you know, it, it was very much about uh, n not maybe building up enough flexibility for the future. And you might remember that we had to build an extra room at Kakubri and an extra room at Castle Douglas just, just around the time of the design stage. Um, the reason it's so challenging, I think, is um, that we want we want to be successful because of collaboration and not competition. HMIE are signed up to that as well. They think, they agree with us, if you could actually get schools away from trying to beat the school next door and actually work really closely together for the whole community, we can do even better. So this is all about collaboration, not competition. But we've got that difficulty that as a head teacher, and I was a secondary head, when you're employed to be that secondary head, you're responsible to that community, and you want your school to be as good as it possibly can. So although you're taking account of other schools, you want your school to be terrific. So what we've had to work really hard with the head teachers, and about the secondary heads in particular, work really hard with them to say, it's a sign of your success, it's not how big your school should be, it's what you contribute to the whole town. And because we do know that rules fluctuate, we know that different things happen at different schools at different times, that encourage kids to go or not to go, and what we've tried to say is let's look four or five years down the line and make sure that we've got schools that have the right design capacity. Um, and we can't achieve that without planning. And you, a lot of you are aware of the current pain that some parents are going through in terms of enrolment in schools and appeals because we hadn't had enough long-term planning to try and avoid the situation where a school gets too big or too small. Um, if, every head teacher, and I think this is just really important, every I'll just pick the secondaries. Every secondary head in Dumfries could have an argument that their school should be built bigger than what we're designing it for. And I'll just pick a couple. The high school could say, we're on the up. We could actually take 1,200 kids, never mind, to get 110. Maxwellton High, I'm sorry, the new Northwest Cluster, Max High section, could say, there'll be more kids in Northwest and Peace than we give them credit for. The academy could look at kids that are coming through P5, P6, and say, we look as if we could end up with a lot more. St. Joseph could say, we've had, the, we've had the highest school role across the Greece for the last five years. Why are we not getting the biggest school? So every head teacher we've had to work really hard with to say everyone has to compromise to get something that will work right across the board, and we need them to get behind that. 
The one thing I would say as well is that setting a ceiling also sets a floor. So by setting a ceiling, it gives protection for everybody else. So say during a decant or something during the build phase, a school became unpopular because parents didn't want to go near that building site. We're saying, you can't leave, you can't move away, you can't all go to the high school because it's open. We're going to try and maintain in the transition stage a cap that gets us to four years down the line to the sort of design phase we want. So it's difficult just now. I would say that we've got the head teachers bought into that agenda in terms of compromise, and we're, we're very hopeful and we've got good news. There we go. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> My first time. Um, can I say that we are, as EIS and secondary teachers, we are very supportive of the need for capping. We understand and we agree with it. But there is concern being shown, certainly with Northwest, that we don't want a situation like there is developing in a school out with um, Dumfries with regards to being able to go to your local school. What sort of evidence do we have that the numbers for capping are right, particularly for the Northwest cluster? I think the whole team has to go for six months, so on every historic trend and future projections from not only our region, but also across Scotland to try and map it out. It is not an exact science, but we are aware of movements, we're aware of cohorts, and we've factored all that in. We've done a lot of modelling. We've all spoken to a lot of um, different aspects of our communities, our learning community, to get their opinion to help talk about this. And obviously, I've had, I've, I've had discussions with the unions as well about this, about how we best predict it. And it's a balance between, I think it would be unreasonable to think we're ever going to get all of our catchment children in our schools. So we're balancing that aspect between the learner and the parent choice as well. Um, we feel that we've had a robust exercise that's been tested out by the individual school head teachers who know their communities very well, know their staff and cohort very well. Um, but as I said, it's been a, it's a balance based on data, based on qualitative assessments, um, and we are, we're, we're comfortable with what we're proposing here. Could I just add to that again? I, I fully understand the question. Um, and, and again, when, when I said that every secondary school could have an argument for being bigger, I think for every secondary school, we've got a good argument for why we're sitting at this figure. And in, in the case of Maxwellton High School, bearing in mind it's currently sitting at 301, it has got the biggest jump in terms of additional capacity, up to 500. So it's, it's got the biggest jump in terms of the possibilities. But we do also recognise that doesn't take account of everybody who might be living in North West Increase, just trying to get the right balance has been challenging. We've worked really hard at that, Bob, and, and I hope we've got it right. I think we have got it right. Andy? Um, thanks, Chair. Uh, I'm on page 72, actually. It's about the pupils migrating from uh, northwest and Fries. Um, how, what percentage of them actually are going to St. Joseph's College on faith grounds? Um, as opposed to other, uh, for other reasons. Because the uh, anecdotal evidence, again, is that the role at Mark High is increasing because of the success of the school in recent terms, in recent few years. Um, and other well-known establishments in the borough, perhaps some of the school roles are reducing because the people have now gone back to Mark's High. Um, I, so 
I, I'm agreeing with Bob here in the back here. I, uh, I think, sorry, Robert, on your name, Bob, uh, you, you know, do the figures really stack up here? And um, are we rushing into something um, at this moment in time? Claire? We are not, we have got all the up-to-date figures and continue to use maybe six months to see if there's any moves and if any trends that weren't anticipated. Certainly with respect to the Northwest report, there's not any movement there in terms of a rapid upward trajectory that we have seen and have been predicting. Um, in terms of the faith aspect, we'll have to go into specific checks in terms of what the cohort would be in terms of Northwest faith. Um, I don't think it's a large cohort from what I can see. But I would want to see more details of that. Can you come back in, Jeff? Uh, thank you. Um, could you also include, include Wallace Hall? Because I have uh, an awful notion that 200 pupils going to Wallace Hall from outside the region, the vast majority will come from the Max High catchment area. It's not the rest of Wallace Hall cohort, and we'll, we'll look at seeing which specific catchment people they're coming off. They're not all going to come off one school as in the Northwest. It is across four. Um, my, my evidence is drawn from the number of kids standing in the bus stops on Lough Side. Ian? Thanks, Chairman. I think item number nine was to be commended. I didn't make any comments on that. I left that to Peter in regards to that. But item 10, I think it's the same. It's to be commended because of its vision and its future proofing as we move forward into uh, the implementation of the Free Learning Until we certainly the first phase of uh, 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 August, September time next year. But the potential, there is potential here for some uh, concerns being raised. And how do we as members, how do we see that coming back to uh, being reported back to us? Because we didn't see that within the recommendations. How do, if, if there is a real conflict or any things need to be shown in a flexibility, it, it's maybe already built in there, but it's, if, as members, if, if concerns do come forward, how do we see that getting reported back to us so that, so that we can then respond to that? Okay. Probably a number of response items, you know, as, as um, a team, we work closely with stakeholders, we value that a lot, so we've reviewed the stakeholder um, comments and as much as possible we're still wanting to capture that. Um, so we continue to do that on a six-monthly basis, you know, we do that as normal in terms of looking at numbers, we've had the appeals process at the end of date, we'll do it again in January, and it's actually a constant, a constant exercise. What I would also say is, you know, we'll send out electronic letter invites to um, all our contribution events and all our Douglas learning events. Because again, you know, like every other thing that we do, you can see from there, you can observe, you can see and hear. Um, as we did with WP Learning Campus, um, the appeal and contract was set up a database. So every person's comment is recorded. It's allocated a category or item. Um, and so we can monitor the level that we're able to respond to, we're able to include. And equally, in, in the graffiti aspect, there's a very low percentage, 5% we've not been able to incorporate. But most importantly, we have a reason for not incorporating that content, and that is based on those kind of values. So, I like to mention that certainly, you know, like everything else, it's going to be very transparent and it's part of the reporting going forward. If that invite was through the uh, Microsoft Outlook and electronic invite, that would certainly be appreciated from, from my aspect. And it's quite clear it's in the diary, and we can make sure we get there. Because I found them very previous in the past, I've missed her quite a few lately because she's because of other commitments, but certainly it's helped. Greatly for myself and the team. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, just a brief comment. It's um, under personal support for learning. There's mention there about appropriate support touches being offered and uh, access within each school. Uh, presumably that will require training, up training for staff that's delivering guidance. Support for these positions, important positions. Can I just clarify which paragraph you're speaking against? Uh, page 82. And it's in the very middle there, reference to appropriate support statutes being offered and access within each educational setting. Presumably, that support's being offered by teaching staff, support staff. Chair, I, I, I can answer that one, Robert. Um, I think it would be true to say that there will, will probably almost never have been a project will, that will have seen more teachers more involved in seeing the bigger picture and the progression for young people. I, I, I genuinely believe that. 
and we're, we're always saying that whilst it's important to get training for specialist staff, for skilled staff, it's really important to involve all staff. And in this learning town situation, we're already beginning to see many teachers across the schools beginning to see what, what, what happens if somebody moves from primary four all the way through to S4, or S5 or into the learning hub. So I think this system and structure in itself, because of the involvement, the wider involvement of teachers, is likely to see them taking that bigger picture in terms of classroom. Sorry, which will require, presumably, an input to those staff to support them. Not just the, as you say, the special staff, but all staff. Okay, Rob. Thanks, Chairman. I, I'd, um, I, in one sense, hadn't wanted to leave us so late in the um, in, in, in the debate, but, but we'll politely. I'm interested in the mechanics of this. If we've got 45% of our trainee people who don't attend their designated classroom, 70% secondary pupils. We've talked so far in abstract about this and what it means, but in practical terms, what is going to happen next year given those percentages when it comes to the P1s and the S1s? Uh, and what is it going to mean for us as elected members? I think you maybe see where I'm going with this. Um, probably two aspects of that is looking at the first step and the second step. The next step is what we can get with authority to say is about the catching aspect. I think the other aspect is actually trying to get a system in place which actually can reflect what you're saying. You know, there's some there's some clear indicators which would be things down to there. So for example, um Brown Hall Carlaverick are uh, catchment is over to uh, the high school, which means parents are travelling all the way across or learners travelling across into town. So there's a lot of there's a lot of simple things which respond very directly to what you're saying. So we're trying to make sense and actually get a system in place which reflects patterns of travel, work patterns, childcare arrangements. But what we will do is demonstrate that in the next paper that brings us the Garden for Catchment Review. So then that makes some sense of the 45% and the 70%. It's getting underneath that to say, why is that happening? And there are drivers to say why it's happening, but that'll be addressed under the catchment. Can I add to that as well, Chair, but just like, again, very specifically for yourself, uh, Councillor, um, we're, we're trying to find this model of best fit, and what I said earlier, but trying to make sense of something which is more of a, I'll use the word mess carefully, but more messy than anywhere else in the country, in terms of kids going all over the place and not getting the progression from primary to secondary. There remains parent choice. That doesn't change. Right? Parents are always able to put in a placement request to any school that they choose to. And if there is sufficient space, that child will get into that school. That doesn't change. And we won't be in a position where, although it might be nicer in terms of progression and easier, we won't get to a position where every single child in certain schools go to the, 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 the school that you might have expected to. Um, but what we're, what, and you might still find that 20% of the kids in St. Joe's Wanted, uh, you know, 20% of the kids in St. Joe's came from schools that weren't associated, and 20% of the kids at Max High are not from schools that are associated. But what we're trying to do is, is create a situation where we don't have extreme spikes in that agenda. So from a councillor point of view, what you might find is that you might be sitting on appeals panels next year where most kids will still get to the school of their choice. And we've looked at those figures carefully. The majority of young people, even if it's not their own catchment school, will get to the school of their choice. But you may find, if, we're, if we are actually committed to the longer term vision, you may find that you've got kids applying to go to a school where there is physically space in the current old building who can't go to the school because it's above the cap that they've set. Okay? And we believe that would always be non-catchment, right? But it might mean some difficult decisions for, for well, it's not for councillors, but for self in terms, us in terms of the process, and then for appeals panels to look at. There will almost inevitably be a little bit of pain in the first couple of years as we get to a system that's going to work. But if you consider that at the moment we've got 50 appeals going on that's causing that's causing a lot of pain because in the past we just allowed anybody to go to anywhere, then I think there'll be a, an appropriate balance struck. But we will certainly come back to you well before August 2016 as to exactly what the approach is. 
Yeah, I, I think, you know, in terms of having 70% of our primary school students not going to a practicing secondary school, it also makes it much more difficult to manage the transition. It has to be recognised as a, a crucial part of uh, that sort of uh, phase in the youngster's life is moving from primary school to secondary school. So I would uh, recognise that. Andy? Yeah. Um, thanks, Chair. Uh, what I'm now noticing here in the papers in the actual part is the knock-on effect to the primary part and the secondary part. So the two are interlinked, especially when we've got it all through school. Um, we've also got the, position, uh, the, the potential in some places for children to be placed in primary school for parents to get, get them to the, their preferred secondary school. How do we deal with that in a cap and trade world? Um, I think there's maybe more work needs to be done in this world to clarify that. Sorry, could you just repeat the first question again? Thanks. Uh, okay, Ness. So, <laughs> Ness I'll, I'll return in King. Ness, it, um, it, it's the effect of the primary school capping on the secondary school capping because it, it will be a, a major part, particularly in all through school. I think that's, that's why under 2.4 um, we've asked that we actually go and look at our catchment zones and primary zones because we what we need to is we need to look at the whole learner journey. The capping paper is based on our functional capacities as they are now. It's also based on the functional capacities that we're looking for for the new build. So it, it, it's taken very much on a raw, raw data basis. But what Dumfries Learning Town is about is actually about planning a consistent learner journey, about parity of opportunity. And that's where the catchment zones and therefore how those cluster schools work together. Because we are, we do really want to see a dumpy learning journey. It is about teaching staff, pupils and parents being able to um, work across the whole town. We know a big part of learning for young people actually also takes place out of the classroom. And it's about those other learning zones and, and places that um, also impact on our cluster, cluster catchments and therefore the learner's journey. So that's why, the, as I say, the, the capping is, is fundamentally a, a decision about how we match up the functional capacity and the catchment and cluster zones is far more complex than that. Um, thanks for letting me back in. Here. I, I think Vanessa's uh, words, and we need to look at a number of issues uh, if sufficient because the campus uh, dream, whatever you want to call it, or vision, it's a professional vision, and the parents themselves are only interested in their own kids. So we've got a conflict here between a professional vision and what parents want for their own children. And that's what they worry. And that's when they'll come to the local elected, mem elected members and have surgeries and be unhappy about it. So let's face up to it now, I think, Ben. Even if it takes us an extra two or three months, get it right and go out and consult everyone. I mean, for the, have the parents, teachers been consulted in this? Chair, Chair, can I just say we have faced up to it. That's precisely what we're doing just now. Um, it wouldn't be, there isn't really more work that can be done on the figures. We've done every possible piece of work we can with schools around that agenda. If, if the prime concern is that every parent gets to go to a school of their choice, then we wouldn't have bothered. We would just leave the, the great big old schools the size of they are. That's not bringing about the best for everyone. What we need to do is work carefully with parents, with teachers, um, and, and, and with the community to demonstrate that we're making sensible decisions here in order to allow every child to attend a really, really good school. So at some point, I think you're right, Andy, there is a wee bit of conflict in the sense that, and we've got that conflict just now, we've got 50 appeals running just now for parents who want to go to a school that they feel is, not, is the one they want to go to and is not big enough for them. If we don't plan really carefully, and take it on head on at this stage, we'll have a challenge. And, but do remember that when we set these, as I hope you will, agree to this paper today, there is still flexibility because we'll be reviewing any patterns and reviewing as we go through the next three or four years, but we need to make a start at some point. I will also add to that, you know, we have had a lot of discussion with parent, parent councils, um, with the joint parent council across the three schools we've got with them as well. And everybody is consistently acknowledging that this is a piece of work that needs to be in place in order to deliver this vision and take it forward and to make a better future for our children and young people. 
what I would say as well in terms of um, if we do get decisions from committees, say, and we go to review the catchments, that is a form of statutory consultation process which Education Scotland will be involved in, and all users and interested parties will be part of that. We acknowledge this is the first part of the process, and we're fully prepared to tackle some of the issues raised, and that will be tackled as part of it. Okay? So if we can move to the recommendation. Okay, moving the recommendation, 2.1, note proficiency to increase learning towns and offering of equal opportunity irrespective of postcode or geographical location. That's detailed in Appendix 1, we've done that. 2.2, agree the proposal to introduce capping processes from August 2016 onwards for the duration of the implementation of the increased learning town development until 2022. Appendix 2 and 3. 2.3, note information on the current methodology for establishing primary and secondary capacities based on functional designs mastered by the school estate. And 2.4, agree that revised capping capacity should be used when undertaking, and this is a crucial point, a review of the catchment zone for nursery, primary, and secondary schools in Dundee. And we'll follow up action. Thank you. I've got no other business being urgent for the chairman to be considered in the, uh, the public forum, but we do have the, um, the other item in terms of the um, John Wallace stuff. So if we can ensure that uh, members of the public in.